Hello and welcome to another edition of the ASCA Weekly Podcast. I am your host, Charles Fallon, back in here again to discuss all the action from it. Certainly action-packed, wild week of racing in West Virginia. We learned a lot of things. Um, the Ronnie Woods Motorsports winning streak has been snapped. They have been conquered by, you could argue, the two most dominant drivers in the modern era in the Craftsman Series and the Cup Series, and Chris Barrymore and Diego Orchidi scoring their first wins in those respective series in 2024. We got a heartbreak for the ages to talk about. Um, a big name team having some big time struggles to open the new year. Um, further discussing a horrific accident that took place in the Craftsman Tutors Biscuit World 100. More silly season discussions. And then, of course, previewing next week's Ares 200 at the Stoneyard, or should I say, this week's Ares 200 at the Stoneyard. But first, I'd be remiss if I did not shout out the ASCA's premier partners and this podcast's premier partners, Rowdy Energy. Click the top link in the link tree in the description to go shop Rowdy Energy. And they just brought back Chiseled Ice, a, a fantastic flavor. Um, so, yeah, go get that, you know, while it's still available. And... If you would like to get any replica die casts that are used in the um, Ajax Cup Series on Saturdays, go to Circle B Diecast, Plan B Sales, and on any orders, $20 or more, use code ASCA at checkout. So let's get into all the action from West Virginia, the fastest track in the ASCA. And of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't start talking about this podcast by discussing Diego Orochiti. What more can you say about this guy? I think the biggest talking point is the fact that if you're new to the ASCA, you probably didn't know that when West Virginia was first built, this beautiful $1 billion facility, as they always say, when it was first built in 2018, 2019, 2020, Diego Orchidi was god awful here. He DNF'd in his first two races. Um, the inaugural race, he got wrecked by Chris Barrymore. Um, and then in the um, 2019 edition, he blew an engine um, just past halfway. Then in the 2020 race, you know, coming off of a concussion that he suffered during speed weeks, he finished 12th, was completely irrelevant, but something clicked when they came back here for the second time for the West Banco 250 later on in the season. And Orakiti just absolutely spanked. I mean, spanked the field. And when I say spanked, I mean, he won by an ASCA record 20 seconds over his older brother, Nick Orakiti. 20 seconds. That is a margin of victory unheard of in this sport but yeah he won by 20 seconds and that was the final nail in the coffin for pretty much everyone's championship host because Healy and um Brent Renner struggled horrendously that day they were like right behind Orkidi in points they struggled horrendously Todd Kidd ran well but he finished fourth and then he he couldn't really overcome that and then he had a couple other um, subpar races the following couple weeks. And Diego ended up clinching the title race early. But ever since that West Bank 0250, something, something clicked for this 22 team at West Virginia. And now you fast forward a half decade later, and he's now the track's all-time wins leader. How did that happen? He's now won back-to-back -back races here last year's West Bank 0250. Plus, now his first little general 200, and he extends his um, second longest winning streak in the ASCA up to a decade. So that is 10 straight years of winning races, 2015 to 2024. It's astonishing. It really is astonishing as Diego continues to prove that he is arguably, if not already, the ASCA's modern era's best driver. 
chasing his fourth championship now, gets his first win of 2024, and finally dethrones Ronnie Woods Motorsports. Um, not really much to say other than how he did it, you know, basically just got a huge push from his older brother, Dick, who really did him a solid there with a big push on the restart. And then um, holding up Laquan Scranton just enough battling for second, he was able to hold up Scranton so that um, the 21-year-old didn't have enough time to track down his former arts nemesis. And Diego was able to drive off into the sunset with his 24th career Ajax Cup Series victory. And like I said, once again, extending his winning streak to a decade. And when you look at Diego all-time, he's fourth on the all-time wins list at 33 years of age, 24 career victories. And I look at him and I say he could very easily, very easily surpass Ronnie Woods' mark of 32 Ajax Cup Series wins and become the all-time wins leader when it's said done. I think he can do it within the next three to four years, honestly. Like, at the pace that he's been going lately, I know he only had he only had two wins in 2022, only one win last year, but I think, you know, it seems like um, Orchidi Bros Racing has started to figure out that Mustang much earlier in the season this time around. You know, like, three out of the past four years, it seems like it's taken OBR half the season to get going. Like, they didn't, you know, really get anything going until the Windows 300, and it's like Arkady would sandbag the first half of the season, and then the second half, you just come out and dominate. But it seems like at the start of the season now, Arkady is already flying, is already back out there, you know, up front, leading laps. He's now won a race. He's second in points. I'm just saying, Diego's certainly in the mix. We know he's much more mature now. He drives with much more finesse. I'm looking at that 22 team, and Nick Douglas's championship prediction of Warikidi looks better and better by the day. I'm just going to leave it at that. So, um, yeah, like I said, you know, at 33 years old, he is at, what, um, 24 career wins. I believe Randall Woods' first win of 2021 only put him at 21 career wins when he was 33. So I look at that and I say Arcadia's ahead of where Woods is by three wins. You know, I really, I really think that he has an opportunity to surpass um, Woods' father, Ronnie Woods, on the ASCA's all-time wins list as the winningest driver in the sports history and go down as, you know, the best in the sports history certainly is up there already as it stands even if he were to retire tomorrow for whatever reason but on the other end of the spectrum Rikidi did not lead the most laps you know normally Rikidi is the one that dominates these races he's the one that leads 69 of 100 laps goes on to win for his 24th career victory but that wasn't the case he only led 18 laps in this race and really had, you know, the second or the third best car for much of the day because there was another driver who was out front that led the most laps, and that was Bryn Renner. Bryn Renner had not led the most laps in a race since 2017 until Saturday. That is seven years that he had not led the most laps in a race. He led more laps in that race than he has in any season, any season since 2017. Like, let that sink in. That's, you know, since 2018, they started going to 14 races, you know, 14, 16 race seasons since 2020. He had not led as many laps as he did in one race on Saturday when he led, you know, the nice 69 laps. But unfortunately, a safety violation on the money stop of the day ended up costing the 48 team their first victory of 2024 and extending Chevrolet and Ronnie Woods Motorsports' win streaks. And it's heartbreaking. It's truly gut-wrenching for Bern Renner, especially we all know the news that came out last week. We just talked about it. Um, 
that he is now not returning to this number 48 team of Roddy with most sports. So his career is on the line. And I think in this race, he certainly proved to a lot of teams that, you know, if you're looking for an upgrade in a driver for next season, you need a new face to kind of right the sit, get you um, back on the right track. You need a veteran to come in and do that for you, a proven veteran who's won all the big races in the sport, um, you know, has finished top five in points before been a championship contender, pretty much done everything other than, you know, win a championship. Brendan Rodgers your guy. You know, he, he proved that he can even go out and dominate races if he's got the car to do it. Just obviously it wasn't his fault that he wasn't able to finish it off. It's just his pit crew that cost him now for the second time in three weeks. And I'm hearing reports that um, Ronnie Woods Motorsports is considering a crew, uh, pit crew swap. We'll see if they actually go through with that. But obviously a gut-wrenching way to lose for Brim Renner. You hate to see it for him with all that he's been going through. But I think he proved a lot to ASA team owners that even at 32, going to be 33 in 2025 this guy has a lot left in the tank he's got a lot left to prove um he certainly still has that fire he certainly can still go out and lead laps can dominate races in the right equipment if you need a driver if you if you're looking for an upgrade next season this is your guy that's all i'm gonna say that is your guy if you, you're looking for an upgrade boom you got him right there so It'll be interesting, you know, we're hearing that Orchidi Bears Racing is in the sweepstakes. Um, we're going to talk about them a little bit later in the pole sitter of um, the Little General 200 and his contract situation. Taylor Motorsports looking for a driver for their first full-time season as they continue to, um, the rumors get stronger and stronger that they want to run full-time in both Cup and Craftsman next season. They need a veteran Bridge driver, there you go. Um, shout out the money for Burn Runner. It's Newt's Enterprise, maybe looking for a replacement for Bryce Mann. There you go. You know, so we'll see what goes on with Renner. But I, see, I certainly think he made himself a lot of money, even though he only finished eighth. I think, you know, if you watch the race like these ASCA team owners, that you would know that Renner made a statement that. Um, he is a force to be reckoned with. And as Roddy was more sports as a whole, I think you have to be a little concerned on the craftsman side that they're pretty much a no-show, all three other drivers, especially Colin Ward, only finishing eighth. But on the cup side of things, Ryder made a statement that, hey, you know, we are here to stay. Um, you know, we have this Z01 figured out, dialed in, whatever you want to say, we got it dialed in on like a lot of the teams out there. And even Ross Jackson was able to bring home a top five finish. Todd Kidd finished six. Shane Park, unfortunately, the points leader, um, was caught up in a wreck. He had an awful day, but I don't think it's time to be concerned with Park. You know, it's just an off day. That'll happen. It's unacceptable, but, you know, he's still young. That 24 team is still learning. It's going to happen. I won't say write him off completely yet, We'll see how he performs at the stone yard. But yeah, so Renner made a statement that he and his 48 team, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with throughout the rest of the season. On the other end of the spectrum, what we've been talking about, Rodney Woods Motorsports all season long is potentially the best team, the organization to be reckoned with this season. And Orkiti Bros Racing, you know, competing with them for that best team slot. I think it might be time to hit the panic button for Michael White Racing. This is two straight disastrous weeks for the organization to start out the new season. Um, the streets of Computerville, they were awful. You know, their best finisher was what Randall Woods in the 10th position after he had a speeding penalty, and he was running like ninth before that. You know, he had no speed at his hometown streets, the track that he normally dominates at, no speed there, was struggling to hang inside the top 10, running behind Chris Barrymore for most of the day, and we know how much Barrymore struggles at these road courses. Woods has just been off, and then again, you know, at West Virginia, he was off. You know, he, he just 
was in the bottom half of the top 10 all day. You really didn't see him much, and he finished 11. So this is a guy that was formerly the um, all-time West Virginia wins leader, had two wins, has won this race twice in seven years, just way off on the setup. So it's very interesting to see the 18 team struggling this much, but it's not just the 18 team. It's the 19 team. They're even worse. You know, they were not even close. Um, you know, they were, they went a lot down early and Lester fit his two laps down in 14th. He has had a miserable start to the season and, you know, he is 37 years old. So you have to wonder is it father time for these guys? But then you look at what's going on with Jared Ayers, and he was another guy that was off in this race. He got lapped early on. He was able to get the free pass, luckily get back onto the lead lap. But he finished like 12th. You know, he really couldn't do anything once he got back on the lead lap. They couldn't get that car right. He went high. He went low trying to find speed nothing seemed to work it's an odd time where the 11 of a rookie Braden Bennett is far and away been the best Michael White racing driver this season you know um top five in the Ajax 200 and he finished seven in this race and you know he had a speeding penalty so he bounced back from the speeding penalty to finish seven ahead of all three of his veteran teammates and he was, you know, running top five early in this race as well. So I don't know what the 11 team is doing that the 18, 19, and 20 are missing on, but something, something's got to be fixed here because we're heading, you know, it, it's, it's a 16 race season. And, you know, you can say, oh, there's only, you know, there's 13 races left. These guys got time. Do they though? Do they really? You know. Like, especially for Norm Lester, who DNF'd in the Ajax 200, finished, like, 17th at the streets of Computerville, and then 14th in this race. It If they could not, you know, get a top-five finish here, lead some laps at the Stoneyard, um, a race that he won a couple years ago, I'm hitting the big red panic button for this team, um, you know, for Michael Wright Racing as a whole. They have not led a single lap this season. The only manufacturer to not lead a lap this year has been Toyota. And they haven't even been close these first two weeks. So I don't know what they're doing. And I don't know what they're doing wrong, you know, for Michael White Racing. But clearly they need some wholesale changes. They need to take a long look in the mirror and be like, okay, what what's going on here? You know, I think that, if they cannot bounce back this week in the Airs 200 and show some significant speed at a track that Lester and Woods have won at before, you know, I'm really, I'm really starting to get concerned with them. And then even their Craftsman Series program has been down horrifically this season as well. Dustin Adams, their rookie driver, dead last in points. Tommy Woods has been, he has <laughs> ran himself into trouble at some point, every single race this year, you know, I, I really, I, I just, I don't know, you know, we'll see if they're able to right the ship, but it's not looking good for Michael Ray racing early on in 2024. That's all I'm going to say. Not looking good. They really need a big week to bounce back. One of their drivers has to show up and perform. And if they all miss it again at um, the Stone Yard, it might be time to write them off for the season then for them to start prepping for 2025. And that's the problem is they don't really have that luxury. Like I said, Lester's 37, Woods is 36. They don't have time to be wasting seasons. You know, running um, 11th and 14th every week. It's championship or bust for these guys. And right now it's not looking too good for them. Then as we turn our heads back to the craftsman race, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the horrific lap 28 incident in the Tudor's Biscuit World 100 involving Ian Adande, who had led every lap in the race up to that point and led the opening 27 laps on the outside pool. The rookie 19-year-old was doing a great job 
all day long, managing the race, staying out front, holding off, you know, former craftsman champions, Chris Barrymore, Laquan Scranton, Doug Bowden, all these guys is holding him at bay. Then we get going for the restart here after pit stops. And, um, you know, Barrymore and Chad Wooden had linked up on the top side. Um, Wooden had pushed Barrymore up ahead, but Bowden chose to lay back on the restart instead of pushing Adande. And he tried the generator run to get by him. So Adande, you know, naturally he wants to block that. He goes down and blocks to the bottom. And Bowden just completely, he didn't lay off, basically. He he decided to push Adande in the corner instead of on the straightaway, heading into the corner. And the results were disastrous, nearly deadly. The G-forces in that accident were um, the highest one of the highest ever recorded in ASC history, very similar to that of Dexter Andrews' 2019 Ajax open accident, where he nearly died, suffered a basilar skull fac- fracture, and was lucky to recover. Very similar to the accident that nearly took Dan Rogers' life in the um, um, the Fast at All 200 a decade ago at Ajax Super Speedway. You know, this could have been really, really bad if it wasn't for the safety measures the ASC has taken in recent years. years. So I credit the sanctioning body tremendously for the job that they've done with safety throughout the course of the past decade so that Ina Donley is still with us and only having to deal with a broken thumb and a mild concussion. And, you know, luckily for him, Craftsman is off this week, so he gets an extra couple weeks to prepare for the first night race at Disney on March 26th, Friday night. Um, so, you know, right now doctors are saying that there's a pretty good chance that he'll be able to be back for that race. But, you know, we'll see. Um, not for sure certain if he will be or not. You know, maybe the Ford Development Program doesn't want to rush him back and they have options, you know, to sub for him since, you know, there's cup drivers in this race so they can call up a Cody Turner or Evan Stevens to, you know, sub that they want to, but we'll see if they do or not. But I'm just happy that Adande was able to survive an accident like that because that was absolutely brutal. You know, reports were that he was knocked out and unconscious there for a bit um, after the initial impact, and he hit that wall a ton at what, about 150 miles an hour. Car flew up into the air nearly flipped, landed on its side. Just one of the worst accidents I've ever seen in ASC history. And I'm just glad that he was able to survive that. And some other news is that the ASC placed Doug Bowden on probation for his involvement in that accident. And I say good. I think he honestly should have been suspended. Um, Yeah, that was ridiculous. You cannot lay on a guy's bumper heading into a corner at 150 miles an hour it looked like clear retaliation um it that that type of behavior is unacceptable at a track as high speed as this so I'm happy that the AC did decide to punish Doug Bowden and hopefully you know he you love to see his aggressiveness to mix things up but at some point you gotta pause and be like okay I I need to calm down here. I can get him back in a few laps instead of, you know, pulling that. That was, that was Bush League, no pun intended related to his sponsor, but that was Bush League. And yeah, I'm glad that he's placed on probation and, you know, hopefully he can, he needs to calm down a bit because this is not obviously not the first time he's been placed on probation and not the first time he's been involved in an accident similar to this, because he was also the guy that hooked Dexter Andrews into the inside wall in the 2019 Ajax Open. Don't forget about that one. So he he nearly has had blood on his hands twice, and hopefully this this time he learns a lesson. So that's all I got to say about the incident, and – um talking briefly about Chris Barrymore it's awesome that he's now at 15 career wins one of only four drivers to reach that milestone and he's only 26 years old 
And I know people are saying, oh, wait, you know, it's just a meaningless craftsman race. He can't win anything in Cub. And yeah, he has disappointed at the Cup level. But people don't realize how hard it is to succeed in the Cup Series in this sport. Like, there are so many talented drivers. And people take for granted what guys like Diego Rokita and Randall Woods are able to do because they just make it look easy. And even, you know, out of the young drivers, people take for granted what Greg Healy, Todd Kidd, and Cameron Atwood have been able to do in recent years because they made it look easy, but it's not. And even, you know, four wins for Barry Moore, I think that he's bound to win more races in the future. Um, You know, maybe one day he'll finally get it figured out and finally go on that championship run that we all thought he would go on many years ago. But, yeah, we'll see. It's it's tough for him, but I think we need to congratulate him on 15 career Craftsman wins because at the age of 26, it's remarkable what he's able, what he has done in that series. And um, really, it like I said, it's just remarkable. So congratulations to Barry Moore on that achievement, one of only four drivers in series history to reach that milestone. So that's a big deal. That is a really big deal that does not need to be overlooked. Now, let's talk about the little general 200 pole sitter, Carson Schmidt, who was looking like he was going to have a career day. Um, the last time he won a pole was in the Apple 225 last season, and he immediately lost the lead down the back stretch coming out of turn two and never got it back. He did still bring home a top five finish in the race, though. You know, his first career top five, and it looked like he was growing. And, of course, you know, our Hedy Bears Racing only signed him to a two-year contract because they know with this third team, more than often than not, the driver flops. So they just decided to give Carson Schmidt a short lease off rip. And it's kind of dangerous, especially for a guy that's only 21 years old. You know, he's he's got so much pressure on him to perform. And you can clearly tell that he's been pressing so far this season. Fortunately, the wreck in the AJX 200 wasn't his fault. That was a racing deal between him and Barry Moore. Um, then last week, he's not the best at road courses. So, you know, not surprised that he struggled there. But this race, he led his first career laps and was running in the top five for much of the day until, you know, he just got caught pushing too much. Trying to keep Chris Barrymore and Cameron Atwood at bay, just got caught pushing, got loose, and you know, took himself and Atwood out of the race. So the question is, does Carson Smith deserve an extension? Because the rumblings out are that Orkidi was racing and he and his team are in talks on getting hammering a deal out to keep him in the number 12 for 2025. And I believe the answer is yes. I think he deserves another year. I think, you know, you might be saying, oh, the guy's only got, what, two career top 10 finishes and 18 or so races or 19 races. You know, how does he deserve an extension? The kid's 21 years old. He is extremely young. He's, this is only his second year at Cup, just starting his sophomore year in the Cup series. I'm not seeing Ross Jackson do any big magical things in his second year he's not too much further ahead on the road than schmidt is in points i'm not seeing bryce Mann doing anything spectacular in his second year you know it took laquan scranton until the very end of his second year last season to win races so i think that expecting him to go out and be in the top 10 in points is a bit ridiculous especially in a car that has been notoriously cursed throughout the years. We just saw Henry Brady completely flop in this car um, before Schmidt came into it. And you expect him to magically turn around. Schmidt has already done more, you know, in his little 19 starts than I think Brady had his entire cup career with the two pole awards and his two top 10 finishes. He's flash speed, he's flash potential. He's just a little too mistake prone, but again, he's pushing, he's pressing. He knows that he needs to get everything he can out of this car. He doesn't have time to waste. 
And you got to respect that because his job is on the line. His career is on the line at such a young age. Those mistakes are going to happen. So I think he deserves another year. I really do. People like to say that, you know, he spends more time on TikTok than he does behind the wheel actually practicing and working on his craft. And, you know, that could be that could be the case. But I still see I still think I've been seeing marketable improvement, enough improvement out of him to give him another year. You know, there is the potential that if you do let him go, you know, someone like Snooch Enterprise could scoop him up and he turns out to be the next big thing over there. You know, you just, you can't let a guy go, like, after two years. Like, come on now. Unless he's, if I mean, if he's Hunter Bradley levels of bad, that's one thing. Or if it's a situation like Bryce Mann where he hasn't even been close to the top 10, you know, that's one thing. But I think Schmidt has proven that if you give him good enough stuff, he's got this, he's got the speed, he's got the talent to take it to the front. Give him another year to prove himself. That's my opinion on the Carson Smith situation. <laughs> and now we get to previewing this week's race at the Stone Yard. The year is 200 um, at the Stone Yard, the fourth race of the season. It's hard to believe we're already four races in the season. It literally feels like we just started it yesterday, but we're four races in the season now. We're heading to the Stone Yard this week. And this is a This is a big race, I think, for a lot of guys. Um, I look at the top five in points. It's a big race for all of them, specifically the top three, Todd Kidd, Diego Ortiz, Laquan Scranton. That's your top three right now. Arguably three of the most talented drivers in the sport. Um, I think I expect all three of them to be a factor. It's a big race for Shane Park to kind of bounce back and prove those first two weeks weren't a fluke at some really odd tracks. Um, he won pole for this race last year, led the opening 88 laps. You know, he's shown speed at the Stone Yard before, and we'll see if he's able to do it again. I think it's another big race for guys deep in the standings. We've been talking about them the first few weeks. Greg Healy, Ross Jackson, Laquan, I mean, not Laquan Scranson, um, Norm Luster, continuing to try to dig themselves out of the hole that they built for themselves. I think it's a big race for Cameron Atwood, your defending champion, who was taken out in that Schmidt accident last week. Now he's in a hole. You know, it looked like he was going to be able to bring home a top five finish, but no, now he's in a hole. He's, you know, 10th, 11th in the standing, something like that. Now it's a DNF on his resume. Can he go three straight at the Stone Yard? And you know, start to prove that last season wasn't a fluke. And then we talked about it earlier, Michael White racing. This is a make or break week for them. I would say that their season is on the line right here. If I don't see Randall Woods, a Jared Ayers, or a Norm Lester up front, if they don't qualify well, if they don't lead laps, if none of these guys are able to bring home a top five finish, or at least, you know, top 10 finish, something like that, I'd be extremely concerned. Um, For Bennett, you know, he's a rookie. He's probably going to end up struggling here because rookies, they normally don't fare too well in their first time at the Stone Yard. Um, It's really tough to master this place. But if the proven faces of that organization, like Woods, Lester, and Ayers do not, are not able to bring home a good result. And I am hitting the panic button. I'm selling all my Michael White Racing stock. Y'all can have it. Because if they can't perform here at a track that Woods and Luster have won at, and a track that Ayers has led laps at before, then I'm done with them. You know, so that's that's pretty much it. That is my preview for the Ayers 200 at Stone Yard. My pick for this week, though, I got to go with the defending champion, man. Cameron Atwood, he won the last two races here. Um, and better yet, he's finished second in um, the 2022 races here. So he has not finished any worse than, I believe, is fifth. He's not finished any worse than fifth here in his last, what, five starts? That's dating back to the 2021 Northern 200, where he finished fifth. He's finished fifth in the R200 in 2021, 
second in both of the races in 2022, won both the races in 2023. Come on now, you're telling me you're not going to pick Cameron out with a Stone Yard? I mean, I know it's like Diego Ortiz won here six times. Yes, that is very true. But Atwood, he's built different here. And I really think that he is going to kind of put his stamp on put his um yeah stamp in the winner circle as the fourth different winner of 2024 and once again giving um the blue oval brigade something to celebrate that they are back they're here to stay and they're going to challenge these um ronnie woods motorsports and all these other chevys in the field greg healy laquan scranton and all these guys they're gonna get put on notice by cameron atwood and cj barrymore racing so that wraps up this edition of the ASCA Weekly Podcast. Shout out to everyone that's listened to this so far. Once again, shout out to the ASCA's premier partners, Rowdy Energy and Circle B Diecast. Be sure to use code ASCA once again to save $20. Um, I mean, to get free shipping on any orders of $20 or more at checkout. And yeah, we will be back next week to recap all of the action from the stone yard and um hopefully we're in for a good one this week you know it's only cut this week no craftsmen they'll be back in a couple weeks at disney we're wishing the best to ian and dante and his family right now and yeah so we will see you and um next week to recap the years 200 at the stone yard